Good morning and welcome. Uh, welcome to the symposium, The Path to Ending the HIV Epidemic. I'm Savita Power, Director of the Miami Center for AIDS Research, or CIFAR, at the University of Miami. It is one of 17 national CIFARs that are funded by the NIH and the only one in the state of Florida and is now approaching its 14th birthday. We are fortunate that our university was subsequently funded by the state to establish the HIV AIDS and Emerging Infectious Diseases Institute or HIDE, directed by Dr. Mario Stevenson, and more recently was funded by the NIH for the Center for HIV and Research in Mental Health or CHARM, directed by Dr. Stephen Safran. All three programs, CIFAR, HIDE and CHARM are jointly some, uh, sponsoring this symposium. Mm -hmm. The National EHE Initiative was born in February 2019 with the goal to reduce new HIV infections in the US by 90% in 10 years. At that time, a national survey for HIV AIDS hotspots identified 48 counties that accounted for more than half of new HIV diagnoses. Of these 48 counties, seven are in Florida, which has greater than 115,000 people living with HIV, uh, constituting 12.5% of all cases in the US. An alarming fact is that among the HIV infected people, about 15% are unaware of their infection status, are not in care, and are unknowingly transmitting infections. Miami-Dade represents a hotspot within the Florida hotspot with areas that are specially affected, as you will hear about. We are fortunate to have been generously funded by the NIH for developing innovative EHE projects. Since 2019, between the CIFAR and CHAM, we have received 10 grants as administrative supplements. And in this symposium, we will showcase some of our grantees uh, oh, shown here with projects that incorporate one or more of the four e EHE pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. Within the CIFAR, the EHE projects are coordinated by Drs. Doblecki Lewis and Dr. Michael Kolber. We are extremely grateful to our invited speakers whose presentations will tackle various pieces of this jigsaw puzzle, representing different perspectives for controlling the epidemic, including policy programs and implementation. They will offer 20 minute presentations with 10 minutes of Q&A. Now that there is COVID to contend with, we took the opportunity to link our audience with the talk at noon by Tony Fauci, who is giving medical grand rounds here. Tomorrow, we will end with a discussion on how to combat HIV locally, regionally, and nationally in a forum that will be moderated by Dr. Mario Stevenson. And I invite him now to offer his welcome. Mario. Good morning. Welcome, uh, I'm Mario Stevenson, Professor of Medicine and uh, Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases and also co-director of the CIFAR <clears throat> at the University of Miami. Humanity is facing um, uh, an onslaught by twin pandemics posed by HIV and SARS-CoV-2. And at this time, it's even more important to be able to come together in forums like this and share our knowledge and experiences <clears throat> so that we can better tackle these epidemics. <clears throat> and the University of Miami, researchers at the University of Miami are, are fortunate that we have the, the support of the, the NIH CIFAR. I would also like to acknowledge the state of Florida and our le elected legislators who have committed annual support to the University of Miami to expand our research capacity uh, and particularly to develop strategies for uh, an HIV vaccine and a cure for HIV. <clears throat> and the funding that we've received from the state of Florida has been used to establish two clinical research units. One of these research units is at Jackson Memorial Hospital, where over 80% of our patients there are 
uh, uninsured African Americans who are traditionally not well represented in clinical research studies. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank you all for participating in this symposium today, for, for, for sharing with us your knowledge and your experience. And I look forward to the, the, the listening to the speakers today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saffron? Hi, welcome everyone. We are, uh, for people that are out of town, we're so sorry that this can't be in person. It is really nice to have the winter symposium in uh, Miami, but thank you, um, Savita and Mario, and good morning on behalf of the Center for HIV and Research and Mental Health, or CHARM. Um, I'm the director of that center. We are co-sponsoring this. Um, the We are one of six NIMH funded centers. We're a developmental center um, and we are the only one in the South and we um, are charged with more of the mental health, behavioral and mental health HIV related inequalities that drive the epidemic. And right now we're really focusing on the Miami and South Florida area as was articulated by Dr. Propala, how important that is. So as you look throughout the next couple of days, we do have um, some supplements and other projects that really are trying to address the populations locally that really need it the most, including people who inject drugs, men who have sex with men, and Black and Latin Latinx individuals. Our projects include things like expanding mobile prep services, developing telemedicine test and treat program uh, within local syringe services, expanding HIV and tested, testing and linkage to prevention services to local businesses to reach members of the black community, using social network methods to reach Latinx men who have sex with men and developing strategies for widespread expansion of rapid linkage to treatment and care. Those are some of our um, projects locally that you'll be hearing about through the EHE and EHE supplements. So we really look forward to learning from each other today, hoping to expand upon what we're doing as well as network and share some lessons learned. And I also, on behalf of uh, Savita, Mario and I really wanna uh, thank our administrators, um, Amy, Paco and David, uh, who if we, uh, who just really are fabulous and uh, in general and put this together in particular. Great, thank you, uh, Steve and Mario. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce the Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Dr. Andre Ford. Dr. Ford received his bachelor's degree in public and international affairs from Princeton University and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He's the recipient of numerous honors, including the Gold Humanism in Medicine Award from the AAMC. He's a fellow of several prestigious societies and a member of numerous editorial boards and scientific committees. He's a Haitian born pediatric surgeon who returns regularly to Haiti to provide medical care to its residents and in 2015 performed the first successful separation of conjoined twins over there. Here at UM, Dr. Ford is championing several innovative causes to wipe out the many disparities facing us today. We are fortunate to have a Dean who understands the importance of HIV AIDS research and has made it a pillar of the medical school strategic plan. He has not wavered from the promised institutional support to this program, even in the most challenging times. I invite Dean Ford to say a few words. Oh, thank you so very much, Savita, for those very kind words. Uh, it's, I don't even know if I should add anything else. I should say any questions now. But, but seriously, let me add my welcome to uh, all of you and to the 15th annual HIV Symposium, Miami HIV Symposium, um, which is focusing on ending the um, HIV um, epidemic. Now, what I can say is that there is nothing that is more of a, of a greater priority for the School of Medicine than uh, the activities that, that CIPRO has been engaged in. 
Uh, we believe that uh, the commitment uh, to eradicating this uh, really vexing problem that plays, especially the Miami community, is of utmost importance uh, to us. And it is really part of our mission uh, to provide, uh, uh, to champion health equity. Uh, this is why we are firmly committed. And uh, this is why we really uh, champion the work of our three stalwarts that you heard from already. Uh, Dr. Savita Power, Dr. Mary Stevenson, and Dr. Stephen Saffron. Uh, we believe that uh, they, they hold the key to uh, help improve the health of the citizens of South Florida uh, and the activities uh, that uh, they engage in through the CFA uh, are going to be difference makers long-term. I'm really excited about all the progress that they continue to make. Uh, and I hope that uh, today is going to be yet another opportunity to build on the foundation that uh, they've already established uh, in the path uh, to end uh, the HIV epidemic. Um, I'm particularly grateful for our out-of-town out out of guests who have joined us, especially our NIH uh, colleagues. Uh, without question, your presence uh, adds significantly to the quality of the discussion that's going to take place and also to the importance uh, of the topic uh, that we are going to be dealing with over the next two days. So uh, I welcome everyone and uh, please know that uh, we are fully committed and fully supportive of all of the initiatives uh, that uh, CIFAR and all of my great Star Wars have been embarking on. And you have our firm assurance that uh, our resources are going to be deployed to help you succeed. So thank you for the opportunity to address you. And I wish you a great, successful, and informative conference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Ford. Uh, we will now move on with our presentations for today. And to start with, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Carl Diefenbach, the Director of the Division of AIDS, or DAIDS, at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. He was appointed to this leadership position about 14 years ago, prior to which he was director of the basic sciences program at Dates. Dr. Diefenbach holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Maryland and a PhD in biophysics from the Johns Hopkins University. Under his leadership, the Division of AIDS supports a global research portfolio of more than $1 billion to advance needed infrastructure and biomedical research to achieve its desired objectives. To name a few of these, first of these is to halt the spread of HIV through biomedical prevention strategies that are safe and desirable and the development of an effective vaccine. Dr. Diefenbach has been a major force in advocating treatment as prevention, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and the U equals U message, all of which are now at the core of the EHE movement. A second objective has been to develop novel approaches for the treatment and cure of HIV infection. In fact, the Martin Delaney Collaboratories for HIV Cure stem out of dates. A third objective is to treat and prevent co-infections such as tuberculosis and comorbidities of greatest significance. And fourth is to foster partnerships with scientific and community stakeholders to develop and implement effective interventions. Dr. Diefenbach is a four-time recipient of the NIH Director's Award. He has graciously accepted our invitations to speak in Miami in the past and I'm delighted that he will be giving the plenary talk today, although virtually, but still delighted. Welcome, Dr. Diefenbach. Thank you, Savita. And it is really a pleasure to see all of my colleagues and friends um, in Miami. And I do wish I were there. Uh, we're supposed to get snow for the next week up here in Washington. So we'll see just how much I would be missing by not being there with you. So today I'm going to spend some time talking about not just what it would take to end the epidemic, but what it would take to ultimately end the epidemic. And there is a difference, which I will get into. So I think what we first, we need to start and define um, the challenges we face. And why is HIV so different than other viral infections? Um, and we have been with this epidemic now since the early eighties, um, and these remain our most significant challenges. 
first and foremost, without any retroviral therapy, the disease is invariably progressive and leads to death. The development of an immune response takes time after um, acquisition of HIV. And while autologous neutralizing antibodies appear after several months, they are unable to control viremia. Broad neutralizing antibodies appear only in a percentage of people and often take years to emerge. There's never really been a documented case where HIV has been cleared by an individual after infection. So if this were um, a, a sporting event, it would be virus about 78 million humans zero um, at this point in the epidemic. And there is no protective immunity really against superinfection. And that's the background under which we're operating. Uh, that's our challenges. So the, the key questions I'd like to discuss today are, is what is necessary and sufficient to achieve academic control, epidemic control? And this is really where the EHE effort is focused on epidemic control and getting us down to a transmission rate um, or an incidence of between five and 10% of where we are today. But um, based on the vision that was discussed earlier with uh, that Mario put forward of being able to expand and maintain programs in vaccine and cure, it really is important to think about what is required to truly end the HIV pandemic, not just domestically, but globally as well. So we have not done so well. Um, the global reductions in new infections are way off target for 2020. Um, uh, this graph, if you even included the data from 16, 17, and 18 doesn't look much better. Um, there has been a gradual decline in annual incidence um, between 2010 and 2018, but it's not getting us to where we need to be. Uh, as, as Savita mentioned, uh, the ending the epidemic, a plan for uh, America or EHE was launched um, a couple years ago, and it had the audacious goal of a 75% reduction in new infections in five years. Uh, with um, by 10 years, reducing it by 90%. And it really was built on four pillars. Diagnose people with early as an infection as possible, uh, get people into um, antiretroviral therapy and effectively work with communities to reach and sustain virus viral suppression, prevent new infections, um, including um, provision of pre-exposure prophylaxis and syringe services, and respond quickly to outbreaks through, um, through data and tracking to identify where they occur. So you can go in and test um, and prophylax um, and treat people as quickly as possible to stem future further spread. So let's start with um, an important question. And this is something that is essential in the, the pillars is is treatment as prevention sufficient to truly control the epidemic? And through data that we've collected, it is a really necessary to engage in full-scale treatment um, with good viral suppression, but, and it is necessary, but it is not sufficient to achieve epidemic control. Um, and I think that that is an important point, and that's why the pillars are set up the way they are, to include diagnose, treat, and prevent. Um, and ultimately, we must always remember the goal isn't just initiating people on any retroviral therapy, but uh, obtaining viral suppression and then maintaining that undetectable viral load um, in people through appropriate assistance through uh, behavioral support that is so essential. So if we think about the success, um, for EHE, and really it depends upon um, so significant advances and improvements in addressing these goals. The definition of insanity is continuing to do what you have done for the past 10 years and expect it to get uh, there to be true change. So we really need the resources and get these appropriated to match the challenge ahead. We have to fill the implementation gap in funding. Now, in order to do that, we have to have the ability to move beyond the 57 jurisdictions that were first defined in the EHE. And so I, I just um, put together some bullets in each of the four pillars of the kinds of things that we need to take forward and implement at scale as examples. And all of you have your own ideas and ultimately it's what works in the localities that will make a difference. 
you know, can we get to easing self-testing, making it routine, making testing routine? And can we fully implement full first same day starting of any retroviral therapy at the time of diagnosis? In terms of treatment, we really, really need to work on removing the, the, the barriers uh, that insurance and the cost of antiretrovirals has to access to care. Um, we need to make sure that um, antiretroviral therapy is fully covered within health plans. And we also need to make sure that when people are diagnosed with HIV, there is a support network that engages them. Um, and then they feel that they are cared for and the behavioral and social aspects of treatment and prevention are so essential. It's not just about writing a prescription and some sending somebody off. It, it really is um, a really understanding the person's needs um, and, their, and what are, are, is their pattern for determinants of health that needs to be addressed. On the PrEP side, there are a couple of things we can do. PrEP should be free. PrEP should be free and the, the cost of initiating PrEP in terms of the, the lab tests should also be free. Uh, we need to also improve PrEP and there are um, long acting um, pre-exposure prophylaxis methods that are coming along. Um, and also if we think about how to enhance the use of pre-exposure prophylaxis for women is there are methods being explored right now for co-packaging contraception with PrEP that are, are moving forward in trial. In terms of response, we really need to invest in our public health infrastructure as a nation. Uh, this has been uh, laid um, absolutely clear, the need for this, not just from the HIV epidemic, but through the way many jurisdictions are suffering trying to roll out coronavirus vaccines. The infrastructure is not capable of handling this kind of burden because it hasn't been supported for so long. We really need to work on linkage with diagnosis to get rapid response into care, provide substance services, address and address the gaps um, in this, the social determinants of health. So in terms of the key questions uh, coming back to what is, what is necessary and sufficient to achieve um, epidemic control? On the, and this is really an implementation question at this point, which EHE largely is. Can we scale um, the services needed to reach the people that are so difficult to reach? Can we build the trust in communities uh, among people who are living with HIV and at risk? And can we get to a point where we have sustained services? And I think a lot of what EHE that you'll hear about at this symposium are new, new methods and new innovative ideas for taking implementation to scale. And I think that's going to be a really important set of um, best practices that we can develop together um, as CFARs and ARCs, and ultimately then expand beyond the 57 jurisdictions. So if, if that's what's necessary and sufficient to give us epidemic control, what is needed to help us end the epidemic? So I wanna start and first talk about optimizing HIV prevention and what we are doing to optimize um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, these are two studies that uh, came out this past um, summer. So in the height of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, we had ongoing clinical trials that had enrolled thousands and thousands of people looking at a variety of questions. And in all cases, we really put a full court press on making sure these trials had the necessary support so that we didn't lose participants and we were able to follow through. And in both cases, in the men's study, HPTN-083, we demonstrated that the long-acting injectable uh, cabotegravir, an integrase inhibitor for use in um, HIV prevention outperformed TDF-FTC. It was found to be superior to TDF FTC. Um, fast forward a couple of months, um, the women's study for a variety of reasons was already, always running a little bit behind, uh, but it too found superiority of injectable cabotegravir um, in cisgender women compared uh, to TDF FTC. An important caveat or important side note to the women's study, not only was cabotegravir incredibly potent, but actually um, for the first time in the clinical trial, 
in, 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 its, in uh, this type in African women, uh, there was a strong demonstration that TDF FTC was taken up and used effectively uh, by African women. So I think in some ways, this trial allowed us to develop the, the way of having conversations with this highly impacted population so that uh, access to TDF FTC will be but easier to achieve you know, in the future. That's just a side note. So when we think about the next generations of, of pre-exposure prophylaxis, what we are about is, is choice. What can we, can we develop a menu of choices and options? So there's literally something for everybody. And that would include daily, weekly, or monthly pills, long acting agents, um, such as injectable cabotegravir, um, broad neutralizing antibodies that would be given anywhere from once every two months to once every six months. Um, uh, and that's an important time amount so that people can set it and forget it and then come back um, and live um, knowing they will stay HIV through three through that period of time. Additionally, for women, as I said before, can we then get dual use moving in terms of co-packaging or co-formulating contraception with appropriate HIV prevention strategies. And ultimately, we need to continue to work with the United States Prevention Services Task Force, which gave PrEP a grade A. Um, and under um, the Affordable Care Act, those kinds of activities that receive a grade A are to be free. Uh, the, um, uh, the, public, the Prevention Services Task Force is moving in the direction of making um, this, implementing this recommendation, we need to remove the barriers to access um, and continue to promote use of PrEP, not just as this will protect you, but put it in the context of a healthy lifestyle. And this will make sex better for you um, as you move forward with your new healthy lifestyle. It's all about you know, finding the right packaging and advertisement to make PrEP attractive to, um, uh, people who uh, probably can't acknowledge that their lifestyle um, is associated with risk. They see it as love and that's great. That's what we want. We want a healthy lifestyle, but we also want them to stay protected from acquiring HIV. Let's talk a minute about vaccines. So we are really in a very interesting place right now in the vaccine field. PrEP, if used properly, can be nearly 100% effective. The challenge for PrEP as currently formulated is daily or episodic use remains a behavioral challenge. Can we develop the approaches to give us sustained use of the current methodologies? And that's where the long acting comes in as a way of alleviating or challenging or shifting um, this, the risk associated with um, needing sustained use. Um, so, we do need to acknowledge, however, that even the most advanced PrEP strategies um, will, let's say, will last six months and then require a boosting, does require boosting on a specific schedule. So there ultimately will always be a behavioral component associated with PrEP use. It's just that it changes from a daily component to maybe twice a year component. As we think about a vaccine, that needs to augment and complement what we have with pre-exposure prophylaxis. We need a vaccine with very high efficacy. Furthermore, we need a vaccine that is durable for five years or longer. So if you think about, if you were require uh, twice a year dosing or 12 times a year dosing for PrEP, could we get a vaccine that lasted five, six, seven years where people didn't have to worry about um, uh, their risk of acquiring HIV. That would allow a shift in resources uh, to really provide sustained protection for a larger section of the population. So from a public health perspective, this would be a game changer that is absolutely needed. And we view the, the current work on PrEP as the, an essential bridge to help control the global pandemic and the, and the domestic epidemic now until we get uh, a safe, effective, durable um, HIV vaccine. Not just enough to limit and, and 
prevent new infections and reduce incidence. We really need to start working on a, on a cure to a point where when we achieve um, a level of either a classic cure um, as defined by eradication of all competent virus in the reservoir or sustained virologic control in the absence of any retroviral therapy, that people can sustain this level of ART-free remission, but also they are not um, able to either be reinfected with HIV, nor are they able to transmit HIV. If we are able to use these kinds of tools of latency reversing agents, uh, modified antibodies and infections directed at the reservoir, gene editing, um, if we had to, stem cell transplantation, these are all strategies to consider. Ultimately, we need to have a strategy for cure that is low risk to the patient, scalable, and potentially leads to induction of durable immune mediated control of the virus. And patients need to be at no risk of transmitting HIV or acquiring HIV. It is really important that we continue um, the work on um, HIV cure. And as such, the NIH, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has made a commitment to evaluate stand new technologies and methods to first address cure on sickle cell disease as a model system that you could get to a point where you had a single shot or a single interaction with uh, uh, somebody living with sickle cell disease that would cure their sickle cell disease. Could you then over the next 10 or 20 years scale that and evolve it to where you were addressing HIV in the same way you were addressing sickle cell disease. As crazy as that sounds, um, there are some ideas in, in, uh, in groups working on this. And I think it's the long-term vision of being able to have a low risk to the patient scalable strategy that leads to a durable immune mediated control of the virus or elimination of infectious provirus from within um, individuals. So, you know, that is a, a, a vision and some people say it's a pipe dream, uh, but that is ultimately where we think um, the field needs to not necessarily focus, but that remains the goal of what we are seeking to achieve. So back to our two key questions. Uh, we answered the question about what is needed and sufficient necessary and sufficient to achieve epidemic control. Um, and we talked about the need for full-scale implementation of PrEP, choices for PrEP over the next five to 10 years, and really taking advantage of the advances um, uh, in antiretroviral therapy. I must say that we continue to make advances. Um, just this past year, um, Dolutegravir was approved for use in infants uh, down to very close to their time of birth. So we are making progress across the spectrum of human life from infants to adolescents, to adults, to the aged, to really help us get to a place where we can achieve um, epidemic control. So what is required now at this point to end the pandemic? To our point of view, we need to have a vaccine and a cure to truly end the global pandemic. Uh, and that will require a vaccine that works um, quite well. And that may, and the work on monoclonal, the broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies may be a path toward a vaccine. There are other vaccines in development such as the CMV vaccine um, out, at, out in Oregon, at the Oregon Health Sciences Center and other approaches that may provide this uh, type of coverage. Additionally, uh, gene therapy-based systems for delivery of monoclonals or modified proteins that can achieve the equivalency of a vaccine may ultimately be required. But in the meantime, we need to continue to improve antiretroviral therapy, improve prevention by moving long-acting agents for both prevention and for treatment, and that will allow us to bridge as a, as a nation and as a globe until such time as we have an efficacious vaccine and cure and we can talk about truly ending the global pandemic. 
Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes, um, I'm uh, to the audience. Uh, please uh, type your questions in the webinar Q and A feature, which you can see on the lower edge of the Zoom screen. And uh, thank you, Dr. Diffenbach, for a very uh, excellent presentation. Um, so while people are getting ready for the Q&As, which we don't see any right yet, I want to know when, in your vision, when do you think the first true vaccine is going to surface? Oh, it's, it's, I know it's a big <laughs> process. So let's be completely honest about that. Um, this year, early in, actually last year, early in calendar year 2020, uh, we had an ongoing clinical trial called HVTN702. Uh, and that was to was designed to be a replication and an improvement based upon the design emerging from the RV144 trial, which was the first vaccine that had um, a hint of efficacy that was around 31%. Um, suffice it to say, 702 uh, demonstrated absolutely no efficacy. Um, uh, the the Kaplan-Myers never diverged in any way, shape, or form between the treated and the prevention group. Currently, uh, in the globe, we have two ongoing phase three efficacy trials. We have um, uh, the Imbakoto trial in Sub-Saharan Africa in women, which is the mosaic um, uh, vaccine being delivered, HIV vaccine being delivered by AD26. Uh, it's the Janssen J&J &J product. And we have in the Americas, the Mosaico trial in men who have sex with men and transgender individuals, which is now back open and expected to fully enroll um, in the next couple of months. So both of those are ongoing. If those don't have a readout, I think we're probably five or six years away from the next wave of larger evaluations. And those will grow out of the work of the Chavis and of the other groups that are um, able to um, look at novel ways of inducing broad neutralizing monoclonals. So we are really in a, I won't call it precarious, but the, the bench isn't very deep right now on the vaccine front. Um, there's some really great research ideas out there, but that's the status that we have right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I see a lot of questions now. Uh, Mario's got uh, his hand up. Uh, well, Carol, thank you, thank you for for that terrific uh, uh, keynote uh, presentation. Uh, I just wanted your your perspective on the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on the progress towards um, you know controlling the HIV epidemic. I mean, how how, how impactful do you think the the, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is going to be in limiting our ability to meet some of the targets we set out under the EHE? Uh, initiatives. <clears throat> do you have concerns there? I, I do have concerns there. Um, I, I think there is, is potential for impact. So much of the research enterprise uh, for HIV um, ground to a halt. I imagine uh, your university had the same sort of a situation where the university closed its doors, research um, pretty much stopped. It is slowly opening back up. So uh, just for it's really interesting. So I listened to NPR in the morning. And this week, um, we have had um, the eminent virologist Paul Binash talk about SARS. Today, we had John Moore weighing in about, um, uh, about SARS-CoV-2. So there's been a lot of pivoting by some of our senior um, uh, distinguished uh, scientists in the field. That said, on calls with my um, HRSA and CDC colleagues, they are actually relatively optimistic on what has happened on the boots on the ground level in terms of the way uh, the populations at risk and living with HIV have responded to the pandemic. And uh, they seem to think that um, we may see 
um, not a pure degradation in terms of progress. But clearly, as we reopen, we need to make sure the health departments are ready to come back in and provide the services necessary. I also think at the department of HHS level, we're going to have to really evolve the Ready, Set, Prep program so it is significantly more useful to um, the hardly reached populations that truly need uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And we're hopeful that this administration will move that program in that direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, the number of questions about the potential of using the mRNA uh, approach for uh, HIV vaccines. So let's just go back and remember that um, the vast, vast majority of people who become infected with SARS-CoV-2 recover reasonably well and mount an immune response that is part of that recovery. Therefore, when we use a messenger RNA to deliver that spike protein, we expect a potent immune response that will be protective. We do not have that same confidence that the human body will respond to an HIV envelope. We know for a fact that the body doesn't respond and make a protective immune response. That said, um, perhaps it will be better to use a stabilized trimer delivered by uh, messenger RNA. And we are gearing up to start studies in Q1 of a number of different stabilized envelopes being delivered by uh, messenger RNA. I think it's essential that we explore this. If nothing else, it will speed the, the vaccine development. We won't have to be purifying trimers um, and making protein to evaluate each of these immunogens. If you essentially type in a code, produce the messenger RNA, um, put it into people's arms and look and see what the immunity is against that envelope. And then we can mix and match and build collections of envelope that can rapidly uh, walk us towards broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies if such an approach is practical or feasible. So we're looking at that as a, the, a, a significant area of interest and work for us over the, the coming years. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you know that the University of Miami, we've been working uh, with Ron DeRogier about using, uh, you know, the life promise of a lifelong delivery of potent BNABs using AAV. I was wondering if you would want to comment on your opinion on that or? So that's why I made this, the comment. Um, I was talking about gene therapy. Uh, we may need okay. to use gene therapy for delivery of BNAVs or the ECD4IG are both um, highly potent molecules. The NIH um, at last year's CROI had reported out their phase one trial of delivering a BNAV by AAV uh, in people. Um, and it, um, for a phase one looked I, reasonably promising. So I think there is something to that. And we need to keep this line of research open, not just for treatment, but also prevention um, as we move forward. So I am very supportive of this as, a, as an avenue. Okay. And finally, there are some questions about behavior like long, even with long acting ARTs, you will need people to engage in care. How are you going to engage the people who avoid the healthcare system? And uh, also somebody said they really like the idea of prep free for everyone. When do you think that will happen? Those are the last questions. Uh, let's start, let's take the, the prep question. I remain hopeful that within the next 18 months or so, we can get to a point where uh, prep is free for all. Um, I think that it, it should move in that direction. Um, I, I have been very outspoken on this for years, um, on the importance of the NET US uh, Prevention Services Task Force. I, I think that one, so one of the things that, so my PhD is in biophysics, so what the hell do I know about behavior? Um, and so that is why as the, the division of AIDS, we have formed a very tight bond with the national, the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, with their um, division of AIDS research. Um, and the, the fact that behavior is so essential to everything 
that we do as biomedical sciences is acknowledged and embraced. So this dual approach of acknowledging uh, the importance of behavior in everything we do has, is really making a difference in how we move forward. So as we think about the CIFAR supplements and the ARC supplements that we put out there, it's often been at the, the intersection between behavior and biology. Because I think that's where we need to continue the work because ultimately everything is ultimately driven by local questions. Um, and can we come up with some standards or some approaches that can be then implemented on a person by person basis and ultimately help people to understand the importance of, uh, of adherence and moving, uh, moving this forward. But really it is um, that essential integration of behavioral and biomedical research that we need to continue to foster. And the fact that Steve and Mario and Sabine are all here on the screen together is, is evidence that um, the University of Miami is fully embracing that strategy. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Diefenbach for your responses and wonderful presentation. Thank you. We move on now to Mario to introduce the speaker, first speaker of the PHE award uh, uh, presenters. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Susan Dubleki lewis of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Miami Medical School. Dr. Dubleki's expertise and interest is in expanding HIV treatment and prevention engagement in diverse communities. She has experience in development, training, and implementation of pre-exposure prophylaxis protocols, including direct provision of PrEP and referral models in clinical and research settings, including municipal health departments, public health settings, and community clinics. Dr. DeBlecky's background is in clinical infectious diseases, including HIV, and she has ongoing clinical activities at the University of Miami. <clears throat> and at Jackson Memorial Hospital, as well as Miami-Dade County Health Department, STD Clinic. She is also clinical director for the Division of Infectious Diseases here at the University of Miami. As medical director for the Miami site for the NIH NIID PrEP demonstration project, and as a researcher involved in clinical trials and implementation studies, she has successfully directed recruitment for diverse populations at increased risk for HIV, and has engaged them in PrEP care in particular from the Latino and Black communities in Miami. She directs the University of Miami Mobile PrEP program, a collaboratively conceived initiative to provide low barrier uh, to entry PrEP care for communities with the highest HIV incidence and low access to services. And the Rapid Access Wellness Clinic, a static site uh, here on campus that provides pre-exposure prophylaxis and STD care at no cost. Dr. Dubleki's presentation is uh, mobile prevention services to respond to expanding HIV clusters in South Florida. Dr. Dubleki, the podium is yours. Okay, thank you, Mario. Sorry, I had a little trouble with the screen share there. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, so thank you for the introduction and thank you, um, for the opportunity to present today. I will start my video as well. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to present today a little bit of information about our mobile prep program and also um, a bit about our EHE supplement that we received in uh, 2019 uh, to work on directing mobile services to areas with highest need based on uh, genetic clustering information in collaboration with our colleagues at the Florida Department of Health. Um, so first, a little bit of background on mobile PrEP and PrEP in general in Miami. So Miami is the metropolitan area with the highest rate of new infections um, with HIV in the US. And as we know, PrEP uptake relative to that need remains quite low. Um, and we've done some work previously documenting the structural, social, and provider level barriers to PrEP care in priority populations in Miami. And just to point out a few things, um, cost, hours, transportation, uh, stigma, here in Miami in particular, immigration concerns, 
and difficulty finding supportive providers um, have emerged as prominent local barriers to PrEP. So in response to that, um, and in collaboration with our community partners, we developed the idea of a mobile clinic. Um, this was, you know, this came together over a period of time. Um, we were working with our partners at Prevention 305, a local community-based organization, with the idea of having low barrier prep that was in a non-clinical setting, um, kind of outside of our, our typical STD clinic or even primary care, care clinic um, structure. And um, we were fortunate to work with our collaborators at the Florida Department of Health who were enthusiastic about this idea. Um, when we started, we did not have a vehicle. We had a great collaboration with the Sylvester Game Changer. This was a, um, a vehicle run through our cancer center um, for cancer outreach. And we had a, a very fortunate collaboration where we decided to work together to do cancer outreach alongside um, HIV prevention outreach. Since then, we've been able to acquire our own vehicle, which you can see on the lower right here. Um, and some of the fundamental concepts of the mobile clinic are that it's at zero cost to the patient. Um, we do a full prep visit, including labs, um, evaluation by a provider, prescription, STI testing, and we now also do STI treatment, um, and when appropriate, HIV rapid entry into care. Um, we like to think that this is a low stigma um, environment that's visible in the community. I'm very proud of our staff who are multilingual, multicultural, very welcoming, um, and really are the heart of the program. And we developed our initial five sites based on sort of general HIV incidence data um, based on zip code and input from the community about where services were needed most. Um, you can see our initial sites here on the, the right side. And just some of our first year of data, um, we in general had a, a really positive reception from the community um, and we were really impressed by in general the willingness and actually enthusiasm for receiving uh, PrEP services through a mobile clinic. We did have about 3.4 percent that were baseline HIV reactive, um, several of which were early or acute infections based on um, discordance between rapid testing and uh, RNA or antigen testing. Um, we were quite successful in delivering PrEP and um, we had about two thirds follow up to six months. So based on this early success, we um, did apply for an EHE first year supplement to work with our health department colleagues to use cluster analyses um, to position the mobile services. And I mean, I was excited about this. I remain excited about this because of the opportunity to kind of go from um, from the really molecular data that's collected by the state. This is through their eHARS and HIV trace um, database using um, the genetic distance uh, between um, new diagnoses and, and drill down to where are these clusters emerging and how can we deliver care to those places where we may have hopefully the highest impact? And how can we do that in a way that's congruent with community needs? Um, so the, real, the process of the first EHE supplement uh, was really to develop this workflow with the Florida Department of Health, especially working with Emma Spencer, who you'll hear from tomorrow, and Mara Mishnevitz at the state um, Florida Dep at the Health Department. We had a meeting to work through data sharing, um, to work through how, how we could safely use this data without compromising confidentiality, and then how we could do the analysis as well to see whether we were successful in reaching um, people who were, uh, who were in the areas of these clusters. Um, and sort of long story short, we were able to um, work with Emma and her group, um, and they were able to develop uh, network maps by zip code. And um, we also looked by, uh, by census tract and grouped them by quintiles based on density of cluster members. And then we looked at our current locations as well as where these clusters were located where we did not currently provide services. And um, as again, part of that first EHE supplement, we collectively determined um, the best position for our next location. And that would be here in the Green Star in the middle, which is in the Liberty City area of Miami. 
Um, so the next part of the supplement was to do some community assessment and preparation um, for needs to move into that new area. Um, we partnered with the CHAMP program run by Dr. Sanjaya Kenya, um, and who has been working in that neighborhood for some time um, and who have been present as neighborhood advocates um, for HIV testing and care engagement. We additionally did stakeholder interviews um, and looked at priorities for that community and some of the differences in outreach um, that might be appropriate for moving into a, a new area. Um, just to clarify, when we first started in working with um, Prevention 3 or 5 as our main outreach partner, most of the focus was on electronic outreach through dating apps um, and other uh, social media. And what we learned was that for uh, new areas, in-person outreach might be preferred or as an additional um, source of outreach and referrals. Um, and that there was really a history of difficulties accessing services, um, many failed attempts in the past, the importance of establishing trust and focusing also on uh, STI testing and treatment as well as uh, PrEP engagement. And just to quickly summarize, we're following up now, uh, looking at how we are reaching uh, those communities that we're serving, in particular, looking at the match um, in our reach relative to the demogra demographics and location data for the uh, clusters. So we're doing this analysis with the state, but we have seen a shift overall uh, towards a better match between our sites and our reach uh, versus the cluster members in those areas. And um, since then, we've also applied for and received uh, extension or an additional supplement for two years to adapt our mobile prep strategies. So this would be addition of implementation strategies to scale out um, and adapt our, our, um, our intervention. So the goal here is to continue our barrier lowering strategy with our core elements, which include uh, no cost to our clients, convenient hours, uh, transportation, multilingual staff, and patient-centered navigation, um, but also to influence and strengthen intentions to in effectively engage um, working with social network component, as well as peer advocacy and in, in engagement. So thank you. Um, I have many people who I have collaborated with and many groups have contributed a lot to this work, um, some of whom are listed here. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Suzanne, that was terrific. And thank you for all your efforts um, in these highly impactful uh, programs in our community. We won't be taking any questions at this point. We are going to be taking a break, a um, uh, bio break, and we're going to be reconvening at 10.40 sharp. Uh, so please join us then for the next installment of this uh, symposium. Thank you. Um, so I, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Julia Marcus, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist and associate professor in the Department of Population Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute, as well as an adjunct faculty at the Fenway Institute, one of my favorite places where I used to work more frequently. And sadly, we did not overlap. Um, but I follow Julia Marcus on Twitter, and uh, she has some really interesting things to say. Her research focuses on improving the implementation of PrEP to prevent new HIV infections and promote sexual health in the U.S. Her studies have leveraged data from electronic health records to identify patients who may benefit from PrEP, characterize PrEP uptake and continuation, and document clinical outcomes among PrEP users. She is leading implementation projects to evaluate whether predictive analytics and clinical decision support can improve PrEP prescribing in diverse healthcare settings. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Julia Marcus. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, all right, hopefully you all can see this. Um, thank you so much to the Miami CIFAR for this opportunity to present um, on my 40th birthday. <laughs> Um, so I'm not going to be talking about COVID today, but I do just want to mention um, what I think is an interesting moment that we're in here, 
this prevention transition from non-pharmaceutical interventions, masks and distancing, to this highly effective prevention strategy, COVID-19 vaccines. And some parallels that I think are relevant to the transition that began about a decade ago from um, condoms and other non-biomedical strategies to PrEP and treatment as prevention. And I think, you know, obviously there's a, these are very different viruses, very different epidemics, but I think there are some lessons that we can bring from what we know about PrEP implementation, um, including the ways that concerns about risk compensation can impede PrEP prescribing and also um, the ways that inequities in access and implementation can limit population impact. So as Dr. Diefenbach was saying, we really, um, we have daily oral PrEP as, as the first um, of many, what will be many choices for PrEP. Um, and this was a, a fantastic PrEP 1.0. We now know this is a, um, a highly effective prevention strategy for multiple priority populations. But it's been around for nearly a decade now and progress in HIV prevention has stalled. We're seeing about 38,000 new infections per year since 2014, despite the availability of PrEP and treatment as prevention. The CDC estimates 1.2 million Americans could benefit from PrEP and why are we seeing a limited impact? Well, only one in five were prescribed it in 2018. And I think perhaps more importantly, it's used least by those who need it most. And so this is where I think um, it, it, we, we really need to think about how equity is the fastest path to population impact. And of course, there are many barriers, um, and I'll talk about a few in, in just a moment. Um, but I want to just briefly mention what, what is the evidence in terms of PrEP and population impact. I think we, we see some limited evidence in the U.S. Um, we see some promising declines in HIV incidents, especially in populations that have high PrEP uptake, specifically white, urban, men who have sex with men. We see that state level PrEP use is associated with a small decrease in HIV diagnoses, again at the state level, so that's an ecological association. But I think overall, we, we can conclude at this point, about a decade in, that we have a highly effective intervention that has had only a modest, if any, population impact. So I'll talk just briefly about a couple of the barriers, and of course there are many to discuss, but a, a couple that I think are relevant to the work I'm going to be talking about today. One is around provider biases that, can, that impede PrEP prescribing. Sarah Calabrese has really led some um, amazing work that has elucidated these biases and how they affect clinical care. And what she's found is that providers, medical students and established providers are less willing to prescribe PrEP to patients who report more condomless sex and more partners. And this is especially true if those patients are black. And so it's this um, kind of combination of moral judgments and concerns about condomless sex um, and, and those are compounded by racist stereotypes. And so the result is that the, the, the patients who are most likely to benefit from PrEP are the least likely to be prescribed it. She's also shown how providers have some personal biases about what they believe are acceptable reasons to discontinue condom use while taking PrEP. They tend to think that conception is an acceptable reason, but not so much pleasure, intimacy, or sexual functioning. And these beliefs affect their willingness to prescribe PrEP. So if we really want to scale up PrEP, we need, we need to normalize discussions about PrEP in primary care. And the ideal way to do that would be to offer PrEP to every primary care patient who walks in the door. But uh, that, that's not currently feasible. And primary care providers are um, stretched for time and dealing with a lot of competing health priorities for their patients. And they also tend to, to think their patients are just not at risk for HIV. When the USPSTF did a systematic review of the evidence, when they came out with their grade A recommendation for PrEP, they highlighted this research gap, the need to develop and validate tools that are highly accurate for identifying people at high risk for HIV acquisition, to help providers identify which patients are going to be most likely to benefit from those discussions about PrEP. There are some existing HIV prediction tools, like this MSM risk index from the CDC. They, ha they have some limitations. First, they require providers to know that a patient is, is in an HIV risk group, so they've only been developed in this country, they've only been developed for MSM. I believe one for people who inject drugs. They are difficult to use during busy clinical visits. The provider has to go through and tally up number of partners, HIV status, um, recent sexual behavior, um, meth use, et cetera. They have limited predictive ability. They tend to, to have um, li limited ability to identify which patients are gonna go on to acquire HIV with area under the curve or AUC or C66 of 0.66 to 0.72. So that's just, 
quite moderate discrimination where 0.5 is no better than the flip of a coin and one would be perfect prediction. And perhaps most concerningly, they tend to underestimate HIV risk in black MSM, whose risk is more driven by network level factors than by individual level factors. And, and so the implementation of these tools could potentially exacerbate inequities. Electronic health records are an untapped opportunity for PrEP implementation. As of 2017, nearly nine in 10 office-based physicians in the US had an EHR, and of course this is even higher now. EHRs have been used to track PrEP use, disparities in clinical outcomes, but they have been used less often to identify potential PrEP candidates and to provide clinical decision support for prescribing. So I wanna give you an idea of what the vision is here. This is the prompt dashboard, which is part of the EHR at Kaiser Northern California. And every, um, every patient who walks in the door, the provider sees this dashboard and it, it gives them some prompts about what preventive services the, the patient may need um, that they're not up to date on. And in this case, the provider is being prompted because this patient is at elevated cardiovascular risk. And this is an automated tool that's built into the EHR that looks through the patient's clinical history and says this patient you know, may, may need some discussion about medic medications for cardiovascular disease. And not only that, the provider is also given tools to understand what went into that calculation, discuss this with the patient, and then prescribe medication as appropriate. So you can imagine here a row for sexual health or for HIV specifically that has an automated tool that prompts the provider if the patient is at elevated risk for HIV based on their demographic, demographic characteristics and, and clinical history, and then gives them some, some clinical decision support tools to have a non-judgmental conversation about PrEP and other um, you know, STI testing, HIV testing, et cetera, and to prescribe PrEP if appropriate. So the first step to uh, um, achieving this vision is to see whether we can actually predict HIV risk using EHR data. And it turns out the answer is yes, we can. So we did this in, at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Um, and I'll give you some examples of what turned out to be predictors of HIV risk in the electronic health record. Demographics, including age, sex, race, and also social deprivation based on, on where a patient lives and whether they live in an area with high HIV incidence. Social history, including MSM status, which is recorded in the electronic health record and, and a, was, um, it, it was missing a lot in the early stages of the study, but it has been improving quite a bit over time. Laboratory tests and results, and not just STI testing and HIV testing, but also urine testing from methadone or cocaine medication use, including medications for erectile dysfunction and syphilis treatment, and then diagnoses of STIs, psychiatric diagnoses, transgender-related diagnoses, and my, my favorite stigmatizing ICD codes for high-risk sexual behavior. So what we did with these, um, these variables was build a machine learning model to predict incident HIV. And we did this in 3.7 million members of Kaiser Northern California. Um, and we, we found that this model that brought in all these different data domains was really strongly um, predictive with an AUC of 0.84. And if you look at this graph here, this is the ROC curves for that full model that brought in all those different variables, which is the top line, um, a purple line. And remember that with an ROC curve, um, a model that reaches the top left corner of the graph is um, perfectly predictive with, with um, high sensitivity and high specificity. Um, and, and that full model was the best model, but then we also evaluated simpler models that included just MSM status, as far as we could tell from the electronic health record, and also STI-related variables, positivity, testing, and treatment. And those, um, those simpler models got closer and closer to that diagonal line, which is no better than the flip of a coin. Um, and interestingly, they, they were particularly um, poor in terms of performance for Black patients compared with white patients. So that full model had equal sensitivity for black and white patients. The simpler models tended to underestimate risk for black patients. And that's consistent with what we've seen with prior HIV prediction tools. So we were reassured that when you bring in variables like where a patient lives and, and neighborhood deprivation index, you get around some of those, um, those structural biases that can affect um, the, the predictive ability of these tools for black patients. I'll also mention that our um, prediction model performed very poorly for women. We were really we, we were we were unable to to really get at gender identity, but to the extent that we could get at gender at all, um, our 
um, our tool did not predict HIV risk for women. And this is still an open question, I think, about whether if you have data, um, if you have more data for women, um, like we, we have very few um, HIV cases in women, but if you have more data for women, can you use EHR data to predict their HIV risk or is it just not possible? This is something we're exploring in an R01 supplement with Christine Dellendorf and Nika Seidman. And this is using data from Florida um, to try to understand whether EHR data from public health clinics can be used to predict HIV risk for women. So um, when I uh, started this study, I didn't know Doug Krakauer, but he independently was doing basically the same study at Atrius Health here in Massachusetts. And we happened to end up in the same department and are now collaborating on implementation projects. Um, and he, he had very similar findings. This was a, another general practice setting like Kaiser, very low risk setting where you're looking for a needle in a haystack trying to find patients who are at risk for HIV. Um, and, and he also found um, a, a, an AUC, a high AUC um, for discriminating between patients who did and did not go on to acquire HIV of 0.91. And he was able to externally validate his model at Fenway Health, a, a community health center here that specializes in care for sexual and gender minorities. And there was some drop off in predictive ability with an AUC of 0.77, so still useful, but, um, but we see how when you take a, a model and you apply it to a different population, you're gonna have some drop off in, ability, predict in prediction. Um, this, uh, this schematic here shows what the distribution of risk scores looked like in his study population. It looked very similar at Kaiser, where the, the vast majority of the population is at very low risk for HIV. And then you have this inflection point for the top one to 2% of patients where risk scores start to go up. And that, that is the, the group of patients where it makes sense to try to prompt discussions about PrEP. So when we published these studies in 2019, the, the New York Times um, picked them up with this really inflammatory headline, would you want a computer to judge your risk of HIV infection? And the, the angle for this article was, um, that these algorithms would, would threaten patient privacy and potentially increase stigma. And we really felt like, actually, it's, um, it's quite the opposite. What we're trying to do is normalize th these discussions in primary care. And nobody is concerned about cardiovascular risk prediction tools, cancer risk prediction tools, and you know, bone, bone fracture risk prediction tools, which are all ubiquitous in, in clinical care. But I do think it is important to, co to consider that um, these are tools that need to be implemented in a way that's um, sensitive to both patients' needs and providers' needs. So um, Doug has led some um, qualitative work and we have built in additional qualitative work to all of our implementation projects to try to understand what providers think about the use of these prediction tools for PrEP and what patients think about them. Doug led focus groups with 42 primary care providers here in Boston at Atrius and at Fenway Health, and they anticipated some benefits of risk prediction tools for PrEP. They felt like it would help them identify potential PrEP candidates that they missed during busy clinical visits, it would help them facilitate discussions about HIV risk, and potentially destigmatize and standardize risk assessment. They also had some concerns. They anticipated some potential negative patient reactions, like, why are you asking me about this? Um, potential breaches and confidentiality are always a concern. And they also question the accur accuracy of model predictions. And really, they didn't like the idea of a black box um, kind of model. They wanted to know why this patient was being flagged as being um, as potentially benefiting from PrEP. Just an example quote here from an, an attending at Atrius Health. I think I should probably be offering PrEP to more people than I'm offering it to. So in that way, it would improve my practice and have me doing something that I would like to be doing. What about patients? When we ask patients about the use of risk prediction tools for PrEP um, in interviews with 32 MSM, again at Fenway and also at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, some themes that came up were the need for providers to contextualize information about risk. It was so interesting to read these interviews and see how the same number could be um, interpreted so differently by different people. Let's say telling somebody you're at a, you have a 1% risk of acquiring HIV in the next year or the next three years, some would think that's very low and some would think it's really high. So you have to, to really think about how to um, communicate about risk in a way that's meaningful to people. people um, MSM doubted the uh, um, ability to quantify risk at a single point in time. Um, a lot of participants said, you know, you don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Risk is dynamic. You can't predict risk. And they also believed that re receiving a high risk score could potentially prompt behavior change. And just a, a quote along those lines, I would think an HIV risk prediction score actually could be helpful in a way. 
I mean, obviously I would take it with a grain of salt, but I think it would help me understand where I am, you know, how I've been doing. Okay, do I continue on the course that I'm on or do I need to readjust? So now I'll just briefly mention a few implementation studies that we're doing to try to understand how these tools can work in clinical practice. The first is funded through the EHD initiative. Um, and this is, uh, this is a project in collaboration with the Jefferson County Health Department in Alabama, which is one of seven hotspot states. They have three primary care clinics and one STI clinic, and they have 17 years of EHR data. And they actually heard that we were doing this work and approached us and said, we have all this EHR data and so little PrEP prescribing and a lot of HIV. So we, we really wanna to try to use our EHR data to, to prompt clinicians to discuss PrEP with the patients who are most likely to benefit. Um, so we are, at this point, we are, we're in the process of re, sort of redoing our whole approach using their data in terms of um, building a model to predict which patients are at risk for HIV. And then we're gonna be building that into the EHR to try to understand whether it can prompt PrEP discussions and PrEP prescribing. We're also doing a pilot trial, and um, this is funded by NIMH in community health centers. And this is with, in collaboration with OCHIN, which is the national network of CHCs with 2.8 million patients. Um, quite a diverse patient population with about two thirds below the poverty line. They have 155 clinics in HIV hotspot counties. And what we're really excited about in this project is the opportunity to explore disseminability. When we first developed these tools in Kaiser and Atrius, it was really just meant to be a proof of concept. Can you do this in, in one setting? And, and also exploring questions about, you know, what, what kind of value does it add to bring in all these additional variables beyond the, the obvious ones around sexual orientation and STIs. Here in Ocean, we have this heterogeneous network of, of geographically diverse clinics seeing different patient populations. And it gives us an opportunity to try to, um, to understand you know, what, is, what is the simplest model that can be translated across settings without too much um, drop off in predictive ability. And the nice thing about OCHIN is they have a centralized EHR. And so it's gonna allow us to um, test the, the impact of, um, of the, a clinical decision support tool in these clinics. And then finally, there's a, a randomized controlled trial that we're doing in primary care at Kaiser or San Francisco. They have um, 121 PCPs who are gonna be randomizing and they serve nearly 190,000 patients. And there is a, a bit of a different model. Um, they refer to a centralized PrEP program. So in a way the, the ask is pretty small here. We're not even asking the PCP to, to prescribe PrEP, we're just asking them to refer for PrEP. Um, and they do, they've been at the cutting edge of PrEP care since FDA approval. They have now have thousands of patients on PrEP, but there are substantial inequities in PrEP prescribing. And so we wanna to try to understand whether a tool like this can, um, can narrow those disparities. Um, the, the trial is actually on hold because of COVID, but hopefully should be starting soon. So just some key points to summarize here. I think to scale up PrEP in the US, we need to normalize PrEP discussions and PrEP prescribing in primary care. Electronic health record prediction models could help providers identify patients who are likely to benefit from those discussions and from PrEP. So some next steps for this work are to try to optimize models, particularly for women and for disseminability, to integrate those models into clinical decision support tools and evaluate their impact on PrEP discussions and prescribing. So I'll just acknowledge my collaborators um, here at Harvard, at Kaiser, um, in uh, Alabama, and my funding from NIAID, NIMH, NIMHD, and Kaiser. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, and oh, I guess there's a little bit of an echo. I apologize. For audience members, please um, post questions in the Q&A, and then I can moderate that. I see some coming in. Um, I did have one comment, which, I mean, in addition to that being an excellent talk and overview, and, you know, I think, obviously, we really value the work that you are doing, otherwise we wouldn't have invited you, of course. Um, I guess I'm wondering, the, the one thing I'm wondering about is just, I'm thinking about kind of Boston and, and maybe even um, where Kaiser is versus places in the South or other places. And, you know, there's identifying these risk scores and, the, and trying to figure out who would benefit most. And then I know that you and also Doug Krakauer are doing work on just making sure providers are um, like, 
non-judgmental and also themselves willing to prescribe PrEP and seeing it as something that, you know, I mean, talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the talk, but just, I feel like different regions of the U.S. are really in different places about how kind of hip the providers are to PrEP in general. And I guess I'm wondering if you, if you could say any more about if any of the work that you're talking about, it kind of will address that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons why we're continuing to do qualitative work in each of these implementation projects, even though, you know, it's been done and here in Boston, we felt like the barriers to PrEP prescribing are not the same in, um, in Jefferson County, Alabama, as they are here in Boston. Um, and they're not the same at Kaiser, uh, you know, as they are. It, it's, it really is different in every setting. And, and so um, I think we have to be aware that, um, you know, we, it, it, of the need to both talk to patients and providers at each step of the process. Okay, cool. I'm gonna read you some of the questions here. So one is, do you think people should be told their estimated risk? Are you concerned that the person could increase their risk if they are told they are at low risk? Yeah, so that, that was something that was explored in those interviews. It, it seemed like it was more, um, the theme that came up more often was that a high risk score would prompt behavior change, less than you know a low risk score prompting somebody to increase their risk. I actually, I wanna be um, clear that the, the goal here is not to hand the patient a number. Um, it, it's really, and I actually, even though we haven't um, got to this, gotten to this stage of implement, implementation, I don't necessarily anticipate that there will be a number that, is, that even the provider sees. It's more about saying this patient is a good patient to talk to about PrEP um, and less about you know, X percent risk in the way that, that I showed with that cardiovascular risk prediction tool. Okay, thanks. Since women's HIV risk acquisition largely depends on a partner's risk, what are other variables we should consider to construct a risk prediction model for women? It's a great question. And we are um, very much in, in the middle of that work. Um, and we've tried to um, bring in, and we're doing this like as we speak at OCEAN, we've tried to bring in variables that we think may help predict HIV risk for women that we hadn't initially included in our models at Kaiser and Atreus since we'd been kind of thinking from an MSM perspective because both of those um, populations, the vast majority of infections were in men. But we're looking at things like PID, um, intimate partner violence, um, the use of contraception, pregnancy, and, and many of these I think are, are sort of shots in the dark and I don't know if they're really gonna help us, but, um, but stay tuned, we're, we're working on it. And I think um, things like zip code or, or living in an area with high HIV incidence can be important for a population like women where you can't really get at their risk directly because as you said, their risk is driven by their partners, um, but you can get it at kind of proxies of risk based on where a patient lives. Okay, we've got a lot of questions here. I'm told that we should just do one or two more so that we um, stay on time. So let's see, people are commenting that this is outstanding. Can I get a copy of the slides? We'll work on that. Um, uh, I don't know how to pick here. Let's see. Someone's asking um, it, how to account for things like race and ethnicity, um, particularly, oh, that one just went away, um, in the EHR data or the OCHIN in the training. Yeah, so um, we are definitely um, uh, thinking a lot about the use of race and ethnicity in these models. We want to be conscious of the ways that um, that structural racism affects PrEP prescribing, and we also want to be conscious of the ways that we are bringing in those biased data into these algorithms. And how does that affect our prediction? Um, what we don't want to do is end up in a situation where we're perpetuating inex inequities with these kinds of tools. And so um, it's something we're being very conscious of at every step of the process. And we've been reading a lot about biases and prediction algorithms and ways to evaluate that and mitigate those biases. Okay, here's one. Uh, should the government promote PrEP as health classes in a high school clinic? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Okay, I don't know how that would go over here in Florida, but um, let's see. David, I'm going to do one more because it's uh, 11.06. So um, let's see. Oh, what about other countries? Do you think these models could be applied and how? 
Yeah, so I, I focused this talk really on domestic work, but there is great work going on um, in, um, mul in multiple countries in Africa that have um, built models for women, built models for heterosexual couples. Like they're really, they're doing different work with a different epidemic. Um, and I think, I don't know of work that's actually moved to the implementation stage there, but there's really great modeling work that's been done. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I think there's a lot more to say that I didn't cover here. Okay, well, um, thank you so much. This really was excellent. People are saying that in the comments. And um, for those of you who, there were a few questions that I was, were, was not able to answer. I'm sure uh, Dr. Marcus would answer them over email or something. Um, and you can uh, Google her email address. And I guess I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Savita Pala, who will introduce our next talk. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Marcus. That was really great. So now we are coming to our next uh, EHE awardee presentation. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hansel Tooks, who is an assistant professor of clinical medicine in, in infectious diseases and principal investigator of the University of Miami Harm Reduction Research Group. His research interests include behavioral interventions and innovative approaches to HIV prevention. While in public health school and medical school, he authored two papers that were highly effective in advocating Florida's first, uh, um, in advocating for the passage of IDEA, the Infectious Disease Elimination Act, which authorized Florida's first legal civil service program. He has extensive experience in working with patients living with HIV, low socioeconomic status, and substance use disorders. Dr. Tooks is a member of the Board of Governors of the Florida Medical Association and has advocated successfully for health policy change in Florida. Most recently, the 2019 authorization of statewide syringe service programs. In recognition of his talents and his innovative research ideas, he's soon to be a recipient of the coveted Avenir Award from National Institute of Drug Abuse. And we wish him future success. Dr. Stokes, the podium is yours. Thank you so much, Savita. That is very, very kind. I'm very excited to, uh, to present this to you. This is uh, telemedicine test and treat and the birth of teleharm reduction for the rapid initiation of antiretrovirals in people who inject drugs. And that was the, the premise of my, uh, my Avenir application. So as we all know, HIV outbreaks uh, continue unmitigated in the United States amongst people who inject drugs. Nationwide, uh, people who inject drugs account for 10% of the 40,000 new HIV infections, which really highlights the importance of HIV prevention and treatment in this vulnerable community. Our go-to evidence-based preventative intervention for HIV and hep C and uh, infection-related uh, injuries are syringe services programs. They're community-based, they're grounded in harm reduction or meeting people where they're at, and at their foundation, they provide access to sterile injection equipment and disposal of used syringes. In the US overdose crisis, syringe services programs have expanded to naloxone distribution, HIV and hep C testing, vaccination, and wound care. They are expressly identified in ending the HIV epidemic as a cornerstone of the prevent pillar, but we can show how they can be leveraged for the other pillars, diagnose, treat, and respond. Decades of research have highlighted the effectiveness of these programs for HIV primary prevention, and they've really come to serve as a home base for people who inject drugs. However, as Savita alluded to, uh, prior to 2016, SSPs were expressly prohibited by law in the great state of Florida. So this is a recent paper in academic medicine that uh, summarizes the last decade of my life. Uh, I spearheaded a 10-year journey to bring SSPs to Florida, and it's no simple task. The political climate here is, we'll say, complex. But I did author those two key translational studies uh, that showed significant need for these programs, primarily in Miami-Dade County, the improper disposal of syringes paper, as well as the high cost of uh, bacterial infections related to injection drug use. Because the legislature authorized a five-year pilot, it was imperative to do rapid evidence-based implementation 
in scientific research at our SSP, including statewide analyses so that we could successfully advocate for expansion of these programs. Uh, the reduction in the number of overdoses, as you see here in this graph, was our earliest success, but the outbreak investigation and response was our second. So we identified seven acute zero conversions shortly after implementing our new uh, HIV testing infrastructure under a Gilead Focus grant. And we had to create a pathway to care for people experiencing homelessness and injecting fentanyl and stimulants um, out, of, uh, out of, a, of a very challenging system. So here you can see the seven participants and you see their X's. The red dot is when they tested positive for HIV. And as we were able to forge a strong partnership with the Department of Health, we were able to support these participants in our program. You can see the blue dots. That's when they became virally suppressed. The average time was 70 days. The partnership with the Department of Health was a seismic shift because prior they had opposed syringe services program legislation in the Capitol. But through our partnership, we were able to link people to care in a mean time of 20 days and viral suppression 50 days thereafter. Uh, importantly, we asked the people who inject drugs who use our program how we could best help them. And one suggestion was that we store medications on site at the SSP and provide medication deliveries. So we've used this community-based participatory research approach to the development of this teleharm reduction intervention, placing people who inject drugs at the center. Unfortunately, in this investigation, only 53% of those who were previously uh, diagnosed with HIV uh, were virally suppressed at the end of the investigation period. And that is because the traditional healthcare system has completely failed people who inject drugs. We are far from our 2020 target of 80% viral suppression in this high priority community. And the reason is there are extensive barriers to viral suppression amongst PWID. You can see here an adaptation of Merrill Singer's syndemic theory, and you can see all of the structural barriers that PWID face that are exacerbated by COVID. One bright spot is the shift to telehealth delivery of services. And, but even though COVID has accelerated the use of telehealth, we had been planning on implementing telehealth uh, for HIV care um, because the, the process to enter HIV care in Miami prior to the test and treat program that my colleague, Dr. Rodriguez spearheaded was two months. So with our uh, 2019 uh, EAG grant, we conducted stakeholder interviews uh, with decision makers so that we could forge a pathway to same day uh, HIV care. We conducted in-depth interviews and we ascertained the acceptability and feasibility. Uh, and we were able to implement our telehealth protocols. We chose telehealth because it's supported by the IDSA and is grounded in evidence. Um, we noticed that an innovative approach rooted in harm reduction would be urgently needed. We needed to set aside the trad traditional healthcare system and take healthcare to the people. But there is a digital divide, so we had to innovate. So, so what is teleharm reduction? It's on-demand services, low barrier access to antiretrovirals, meds for opioid use disorder, and hepatitis C cure. It includes mobile phlebotomy, harm reduction counseling and medication management, uh, mental health and substance use disorder services, and it's all delivered via an SSP, integrated with the provision of evidence-based naloxone and injection equipment. We have to meet people where they're at on their terms and respect their autonomy. Uh, there's decades of evidence of this approach in primary HIV prevention. So just to reiterate teleharm reduction, the patient is at the center. We have uh, peer support with the counselor. They bring the iPad to the patient wherever they are with their medications, with their syringes, with their naloxone, and it's all delivered uh, together, uh, core harm reduction supplies, and there's ongoing motivational interviewing. And we've seen early success piloting this infrastructure at our syringe services program. So you can see here our 2020 pilot data, 43 Ryan White case management visits, um, teleharm reduction visits uh, occurred, and all 43 of those uh, participants in our program uh, had physician visits, all 43 initiated antiretrovirals, and at this time, 33 or 80% are undetectable. So there have been 146 HIV care visits, 655 medical drop, uh, medication drops by my team. We can also do it for meds for opioid use disorder. We are following 29 patients uh, for bup, and there have been uh, 80 uh, telehealth uh, buprenorphine visits. So our next goal is to integrate these specialty uh, pathways of HIV care, buprenorphine, and hepatitis C treatment through teleharm reduction. And that's the Avenir proposal that 
Savita uh, so graciously was referring to. So uh, hopefully we will receive a notice of award for uh, our randomized controlled trial with two uh, SSP sites, uh, Miami and Tampa. Uh, we will randomize participants to either receive the telehealth enhanced intervention or standard uh, patient navigation. And our primary hypothesis is that the teleharm reduction intervention will be superior to patient navigation in HIV viral suppression across time points. We also think it'll be superior for uh, buprenorphine initiation and retention and hepatitis C cure. Importantly, in order to uh, ascertain the, the sustainability of this sort of uh, intervention, we will do a cost effectiveness analysis. My main goal with all of this, I really feel strongly that we need to transform the way we practice medicine. We need to lay the foundation for an enhanced model of care for people who inject drugs to become virally suppressed. We have to transform the way they access healthcare. We have to bring it to them. This is how we forge a pathway towards ending the HIV epidemic in this high priority community. And we want to overcome the tremendous marginalization and stigma by meeting people who inject drugs where they're at on their terms. So I'm really excited uh, to uh, launch this study at the end of the year. I'll be supported by this amazing study team, of course, including my career life mentor, Dr. Lisa Metch. And we are also partnering with the Florida Department of Health, uh, with whom we are leading the statewide SSP rollout. So that is uh, teleharm reduction in a nutshell. And I thank you for your attention. Hey, that was fantastic. Thank you, Ansel. We will not be entertaining any questions. Um, the next talk, uh, Dr. Safran is going to introduce. I was about to just text uh, Dr. Tukes that that was a great, great uh, talk and got distracted by the fabulousness of the work that uh, Dr. Tukes is doing. So thank you, uh, Hansel. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Brian Nastansky. Um, Brian is a member of our CIFAR uh, external advisory board and has been helping support a lot of our CIFAR supplements through the implementation science uh, network over at Northwestern um, that he, you direct that, right, Brian? Yes, okay. Um, anyway, Brian is a tenured professor of medical and social sciences at Northwestern University, director of the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing, co-director of the NIH Third Coast Center for AIDS Research, their CIFAR, and co-director of the NIDA Center for Prevention, Implementation Methodology. He received his PhD in psychology from Indiana University. He has been a principal investigator of, of over 40 million in federal and foundation research and training awards. His current projects include a NIDA funded cohort study of young gay bisexual men that seeks to gain a multi-level uh, perspectives on the drivers of substance use and HIV in this population, two hybrid effectiveness implementation randomized controlled trials of HIV prevention programs for adolescent and young adult gay bisexual men, and an NIMHD funded study of ethical considerations in LGBTQ adolescent population in HIV prevention research. Recognition for his work includes being named a William T. Grant Scholar, an award for distinguished scientific contribution from the Society for the Psychological Study of LGBT Issues of the American Psychological Association in 2017. NBC News selected him from 1,600 nominees as one of 30 change makers and innovators making a positive difference in the LGBT community. So I don't know when Dr. Mostansky sleeps or drinks a cup of coffee or sits down and relaxes, but he certainly is. Um, we are certainly blessed to have him with us and share his thoughts today. Thanks uh, for that great introduction, Steve. And um, thanks to uh, Dr. Safran and Pawa for inviting me to speak today. I wish I was coming to you in person in Miami as, we, as I look out the window and watch the snow coming down here in Chicago. Uh, but we'll just have to uh, once again do with another um, Zoom presentation. I'll say um, I have my Twitter handle on uh, this first slide. I do, um, you know, if we don't have time for all the Q&A and such, uh, I'm happy to continue the discussion on Twitter if anybody wants to do that. And today I'm really going to focus on um, some of the work I've been doing on um, the use of implementation science methods 
to help understand how to um, scale up and scale out interventions that can be helpful in ending the epidemic in the United States. My own work primarily focuses on diverse young men who have sex with men. So that's gonna be many of the examples that I draw from. Uh, but I think the same principles, the same methods can be applied with other populations and with other types of interventions. And, you know, I would say the, the overall, you know, takeaway from that, I, that I hope you might take from my talk today is that, you know, research has produced highly effective biomedical and behavioral HIV prevention and treatment interventions, but they're not reaching the right people at the right time in the right dose in the United States. And that's why what we see is that in recent years, the U.S., the number of new diagnoses has only showed modest declines. Um, and we also know that a large proportion of people living with HIV do not reach sustained viral supp suppression. So we have these effective interventions, but they're not reaching the right people at the right time in the right dose. And um, you know, with this idea that we have this portfolio of tools, we have testing, we have these tools to end the epidemic, to identify people um, living with the virus, um, help with prevention with behavioral, uh, biomedical prevention programs, you know, really the question is, how do we move from scientific discovery to implementation? And it's frequently stated that it takes an average of 17 years for research evidence, evidence to reach clinical practice. Um, and so if we think about these new innovations, PrEP, highly effective treatment, you know, taking 17 years to get from discovery to wide scale implementation and clinical practice reaching the populations, that's too long of a road. We need to find ways to accelerate it. And implementation science is the study of strategies to deliver effective interventions in public health and healthcare settings. And in my presentation today, I'm gonna to describe two examples of what are called hybrid effective implementation trials as methods for accelerating this research practice type timeline. Um, the examples that I'm gonna present focus on individual level interventions designed to increase use of HIV testing and prevention tools like PrEP and condoms a young, among young um, men who have sex with men, which is the population uh, that's the focus of my work. Um, and I'm gonna describe two ongoing trials as an example in the e-health space. But I think um, these same methods, these same approaches could um, be applied to other types of interventions besides e-health interventions. Um, as Steve mentioned, I also co-lead the Implementation Science Coordination, Consultation and Collaboration Initiative, or ISCI. Um, and I'm gonna describe some of the work we're doing to support the use of implementation science within the federal ending the HIV epidemic plan. So I mentioned um, uh, that hybrid trials are a way to accelerate um, the process from discovery to implementation. Many of you are familiar with classic clinical trials, which really focus on demonstrating the effectiveness of an intervention. So you know, over here we have classic um, clinical effectiveness research. Does an intervention work? Often um, is it effective under highly controlled um, research conditions? To on the other end, we have implementation research, which is really focused exclusively on the question of how do we affect healthcare delivery? How do we reach populations? How do we deliver an intervention effectively? But there is this intermediate space called hybrid designs where you're both studying effectiveness and implementation. And I'm gonna give you examples of two types of hybrid trials. One is a type one hybrid trial where you're really still focused on testing the effectiveness of an intervention. Um, but while you're doing that, you're also observing and gathering information on the future implementation of that intervention. I'm also gonna give an example of a hybrid type three trial, which is really testing implementation strategies uh, for the delivery of the intervention. But while you're doing that, you're still observing and gathering information on effectiveness. And you might do that because as it's scaling up, you might have questions about if the intervention is effective, as effective at scale, as it was when it was delivered under highly controlled conditions. You might also have, uh, you might be scaling it out to new populations and new delivery systems as you're, scale, as you're implementing. And so you might wanna reconfirm the effectiveness of the intervention as it's being scaled out. And therefore a type three trial allows you to do both. Um, the first example is the type one trial, which is focused um, primarily on um, uh, studying the effectiveness of an intervention while it's capturing data on implementation. 
And um, it's called the SMART Trial. It's a, a project I lead that's funded by uh, National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And um, it's a SEPT care package of interventions, which I'll, I'll unpack what that is in a second. Um, it's a national inter intervention being delivered um, across the United States. We have um, 1,200, over 1,200 um, diverse adolescent uh, men who have sex with men between the ages of 13 and 18. And in fact, we have participants from every state in the US except Wyoming. So unfortunately, uh, we didn't get Wyoming on the board. If you wanna read more about the particular design of the SMART trial, um, I'll point you to the JMIR research protocol paper that really describes the details of the intervention. But just from a high level, I'll say that this is a stepped care intervention, which means that um, it's, it's really aligned with this traditional public health perspective that um, you have some prevention interventions that you universally deliver, you have some interventions that are selectively delivered, and you have some that are indicated for delivery. Universal means they're oftentimes low cost, you think everyone can benefit from them. And in this case, we have an intervention um, that we adapted um, from uh, this program called Queer Sex Ed, which was a sex education program for LGBT youth. And we thought everyone would benefit from that, so we universally deliver it. And then for those participants that don't respond to queer sex ed, they get stepped up to a more intensive intervention, which is more motivation, behavioral skills focused, not just knowledge. Um, that's an adaptation of Keep It Up for teenagers. I'll talk more about Keep It Up later. And for those participants who don't respond to that selective intense e-health intervention, they get stepped up to individualized motivational interviewing del delivered by coaches who work with them to identify their specific challenges and barriers and motivational issues related to implementing um, an HIV prevention um, intervention. So we're testing the effectiveness of this overall package. And while we're doing that, we're also doing interviews with young MSM about acceptability. We're doing interviews with community-based organizations about how they would implement an e-health intervention. Um, and so that's um, the sort of hybrid nature of this trial. Um, and um, one of the key um, strategies that we're doing as part of the implementation is the adaptation of the intervention. So we've developmentally adapted the content of interventions that have been done with young adults, and we developmentally adapted them for teenagers, the 13 to 18 year olds that are the focus of this intervention. And you can read in this prevention science article led by Dennis Lee a little bit about how we use this process called intervention mapping to developmentally adapt the intervention. We also, inter, um, we also linguistically and culturally adapted the intervention so that all of the content is being delivered bilingually in both English and Spanish. And we did that in collaboration with Carlos Rodriguez Diaz uh, in Washington, DC. Um, and so, you know, that's another form of an implementation strategy is the adaptation of content to particular contexts and populations. Now, I, I recognize looking at this particular slide is probably very overwhelming, and my goal is not to overwhelm you, but to sort of onboard you to the value of thinking about um, an implementation logic model when you're doing implementation research. And I'll come back at the end of my talk with some resources for how to fill out a logic model like this. But a logic model for, an impl for implementation outlines what are the determinants, what are the barriers and facilitators of implementing the intervention? What are the strategies that you're testing? And what are the mechanisms that you think link those strategies to the outcomes that you're studying in your particular um, trial? And this is the logic model for the SMART project. And you can see in gray, we actually have our determinants and our strategies as they relate to the particular trial. But in the blue and orange below that, we've sort of specified what we are learning about delivery in real world systems. What are the barriers and facilitators of real world delivery. Um, and so I'll come back again at the end with um, some resources if you wanna do this logic model. As I mentioned in the context of this trial, we're looking at barriers and facilitators of future delivery of the intervention. And some of the things that we've learned from doing semi-structured interviews with aid service organizations, youth serving organizations and schools is that there is a lot of excitement about the smart content, the e-health e design, the quality of the content, um, how it aligns with youth needs, organizational goals, and the flexibility of delivering an e-health program where young people can do it themselves or it could get integrated into some other curriculum. 
But we also learned that a lot of organizations that deliver services to young people don't have a lot of capacity to deliver technology-based interventions. They don't have, um, they're not, they haven't integrated technology-based programs into their service delivery model. And so it's a little alien to think about delivering an e-health program. We also identified that there's this real challenge that there's a lot of organizations that serve men who have sex with men, and there's organizations that serve youth, but there are very few organizations that serve, sit at the intersections of those two populations. And so um, adult MSM serving organizations are a little reticent to work with youth, and youth organizations, unfortunately, in many cases, are reticent about addressing the LGBT population. And so that's an ongoing barrier to implementation of interventions focused on this population. You can see a little bit about the outcomes. And you know, as somebody I would say that did classic clinical trials, the idea of having so many outcomes at first was really a little unsettling to me. I'm used to a clinical trial where we have one endpoint that says, is this intervention effective or not? But in implementation research, it's often um, common to have many secondary outcomes as well. And that's because um, different stakeholders value different characteristics when it comes to implementation. So for some stakeholders, cost or cost effectiveness is the most important. For other stakeholders, equity is most important. Is it reaching the people who are most in need of this intervention? Um, uh, others are interested in sort of the efficiency, the acceptability to different populations. And so you wanna capture a lot of different implementation outcomes because they're um, relevant to different kinds of stakeholders as you move forward. Um, now let me switch and talk a little bit about the second um, type of design, which is a hybrid type three trial. These are um, trials where you're primarily testing an implementation strategy, but you're also collecting data on, um, continuing to collect data on the effectiveness of the intervention. And an example of this is um, the Keep It Up 3.0 intervention. Um, and we're testing this, the, the really the delivery of how do you deliver an effective evidence-based e-health HIV prevention program. Um, and um, the, the, the intervention that we're testing is called Keep It Up. Keep It Up was put into the compendium of um, the CDC compendium of evidence-based um, interventions. It was the first intervention that was an e-health intervention that showed an effect on a biomedical outcome. So participants randomized to Keep It Up had a 40% lower rate of um, STIs, primarily rectal um, gonorrhea and chlamydia, at the one year follow-up compared to those that got traditional HIV education. So we show this effect on a biomedical outcome, the effectiveness of this e-health program. And now we're studying how do you scale it up? And we're testing two strategies. Um, we're testing one strategy, that's the traditional um, strategy for the deliver, delivery of HIV prevention programs, which is to have community-based organizations um, apply for funding to deliver them. And so we um, selected 66 counties um, that had large numbers of young men who have sex with men, and we randomized them um, to two different strategies. One strategy is uh, for community-based organizations to integrate Keep It Up into their HIV testing programs. And um, under that strategy, we actually put out an RFA, a request for uh, applications from community-based organizations in those 44 counties to apply to Northwestern to get funding to integrate Keep It Up into their HIV testing programs. The other strategy is a direct-to-consumer model where all of the delivery of the intervention is done centrally from Northwestern. We recruit participants um, um, through uh, uh, geospatial apps and other advertising means. We ship them an HIV test kit and an STI collection kit to their house. We deliver the e-health intervention. We follow and track them all from Chicago. So it's a head-to-head -head trial of these two intervention delivery approaches. These are the logic models. Obviously I can't go through all of them, but we have a logic model developed for each arm that really lays out what do we think are the determinants of effective intervention delivery in the direct to consumer arm, the CBO arm? What are the specific strategies that we're testing um, that, we're, that we think uh, uh, will improve delivery of the intervention? And then what are our outcomes, which are the same across both arms? Just to give you one example of this, you can see um, for the CBO arm, um, one, of our, one of our beliefs is that adapting and tailoring the intervention to the particular community-based organization context is an important strategy. And so to do that, you can see over here, we offer tailoring elements 
for each community-based organization as they implement Keep It Up within their, within their organization. So they can include their logo, they can include their own welcome messages, they can include the services that they offer within the intervention. There's trigger points where participants can request different interactions with their staff. Um, and so all of that is tailored to the specific community-based organization, which we believe will increase acceptability to the target population, but will also importantly increase engagement and utilization by the community-based organization staff. Um, another tool that I would say is, is really helpful is we did this Presys 2 wheel where we actually rated um, many aspects of our trial in terms of how pragmatic they are. Uh, and this is a really helpful exercise when you're doing implementation research and you want to be pragmatic is to really hold yourself accountable for what it means to be pragmatic. And um, it produces this wheel and you can see just as one example where we had a difference between the two arms here in um, um, the, the, the setting. Um, and so the delivery score for this, this, um, the setting domain was different uh, because um, we thought that we're actually probably not providing as much funding to CBOs as they might get from their health department or from the CDC. So we gave ourselves a little bit of a hit on pragmatism. Um, whereas for the direct to consumer strategy, we thought that um, the delivery score was lower than the CBO, um, given that we have our Northwestern staff delivering the intervention and many of them had been involved in the Keep It Up intervention for a while. And so maybe they don't resemble the staff that would ultimately be delivering an intervention. So this is really a helpful tool in doing implementation research. Um, just for the sake of time, I just want to wrap up and say, you know, I covered a lot of things, um, um, a lot of things about hybrid trials, about uh, implementation logic models, this Presys tool. Um, Nanette Benbow and I co-lead this coordination initiative for the Ending the Epidemic um, initiative that the NIH participates in, which is really focused on identifying best practices and strategies uh, for delivering interventions to help end the epidemic. This is our team working on ISCI. And I don't have time to go into a ton of details, but um, our ultimate goal of this initiative is to really support collaboration and coordination across these projects in a way that what's learned locally at particular clinics in particular settings can be generalized and can create generalizable knowledge about the strategies that are most effective in implementing these effective interventions. And I would point you to say that you're all welcome to go to our community of practice website um, um, isc3i.isgem.northwestern.edu. Um, we've made many of these tools publicly available. We have webinars, reading courses, um, um, and uh, for those who are part of the EHA initiative, there's also coaching, discussion boards, and virtual groups. But many of these resources are publicly available, including um, webinars that we've done on designs for implementation research, how to do an implementation research logic model. We've heard from our federal partners at the CDC and HRSA about the EHE initiative, and all of that information is publicly available on that website. Um, so with that, I will wrap up, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so please remember to type your questions into the question and answer box. Um, you know, I, I, this was a great talk and also so important. And I know that our mentees and our EHE supplement um, award winners have been utilizing your, um, your network and, and the resources that you were talking about towards the end. Um, I'm wondering if there's any, I mean, I think maybe the whole talk was this, but I guess I'm wondering if there's any, I don't know, tips for, we have the new EAG supplements coming out. Uh, the announcement just came out, I think yesterday and given probably your role in helping, you know, maybe shape projects once they're funded and also helping continuing to support the current projects, any kernels of wisdom, you know, in terms of um, the, the different types of trials or the, or the um, you know, different types of hybrid trials that might be able to be folded into something like, the, like, like these. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, as, um, as, it, as it relates to the specific supplement process for these EHE um, pilot studies, um, you know, it's, it's one year of funding, 
you know, it's not a five-year R01 where you could do a necessarily do a hybrid trial. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the things that, that I would just say is just keep thinking about the word strategies, 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 strategies. What are the implementation strategies that you're examining that you think could make a difference in more effective reach of PrEP, in better testing, in um, um, retention in care, rapid art, all of those interventions that we have, those interventions are testing, care, PrEP. The strategies are the implementation approaches that will improve the delivery and reach of those interventions. And, um, you know, it gets, there's a lot of confusion about what's an intervention and what's a strategy. But I think the more you focus on the idea of, you know, what are the strategies that I want to test that I think could make a difference in the delivery of these interventions. Um, and maybe piloting those, piloting, you know, two different inter implementation strategies. Um, I, I would love to see the work uh, move and we see year over year more progression. You know, there are these phases of implementation science from more exploration to preparation to implementation to sustainment. Many of the initial projects were really at that exploratory phase of like, what are the determinants of PrEP? Why do some people take PrEP and others don't? Um, and we're starting to see movement more towards identification of implementation strategies and pilot testing of implementation strategies. So my advice um, to, would be for everyone thinking about this to say, let's move beyond um, identifying the barriers and facilitators of um, delivering of these interventions and really start thinking about what strategies are going to overcome those barriers and how can I begin to test them. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question and we have one more question from uh, Dr. Chris Gordon. Brian, great talk. There's a tension between size and outcomes from large implementation science trials and the urgency to have best practices that public health decision makers need now. How do you balance this? Oh, it just moved. And are there lessons learned along the way for a four to five year outcome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, what you don't want to do is um, spend five years testing an intervention or an implementation strategy only to discover that it works and is now irrelevant because the world's moved on. You know, so it's like, this intervention's great. It really reduced risk. And the whole health system has changed over the five years of our studying it. And so who cares? Uh, you know, and I, I say that with uh, as many fingers pointing at myself as anyone else, you know, um, and it's a real challenge. And I think, you know, one, one of the things that can be really helpful is the extent to which as a scientist, you are engaged and connected with your local public health system, your health department, the community organizations that are delivering these services so that there can be some learning and sharing of lessons, you know, in the real world as learning has happened in science. And so, you know, if you take the example of Keep It Up, you know, I moved from a small RCT of the Keep It Up intervention, you know, a pilot trial, through now, you know, we did a large R01, um, a multi-site randomized trial of effectiveness. Now we're doing this implementation trial. But along the way, we've been partnering with community organizations around the country to deliver Keep It Up. So we had what we called Keep It Up 1.5, which was funded by the Chicago Department of Public Health to deliver Keep It Up as a local homegrown intervention for young gay men in Chicago. And hundreds of young MSM received Keep It Up as part of that um, service delivery project. Similarly, um, um, a clinic in Jackson, Mississippi reached out to us um, wanting to implement Keep It Up. And we worked with them to find ways to, keep, to integrate Keep It Up into their program. So I think part of it is sometimes being a little flexible about not waiting until you've done your pilot RCT, your effectiveness RCT, your implementation trial, before you start sharing what you've learned and help working with organizations that might be able to implement some of those lessons and those interventions along the way. Awesome. Um, I lied. We can have another question apparently because you have till um, 11.50. So um, there's three more. Two of them are related. So I guess I'll just go with those. And it's about ethical issues and talking about sex among uh, adolescent populations and addressing the barrier of prescribing PrEP when um, parental consent is concern is required. The other one, I'll just say the other question too, just in case you can get to it. Um, but also just with the logic models, um, he didn't see feedback arrows going back and do you consider them live? Maybe that's a quick answer. Yeah, you know, I would say 
for our implementation logic model, you're right, we're sort of going from determinants to strategies to mechanisms to outcomes. But, you know, we consider our logic models living documents. When you're doing implementation research, you have to be adaptive as you go. Like, you, we are refining our strategies. <laughs> if, um, you know, if we find that clinics need more support in understanding how to deliver the intervention, we're not going to fix that and just keep giving them limited support for five years just to show that the intervention didn't work. So we do update our logic model as we're learning about new what we consider more like micro or fine grained strategies um, and documenting when we added those. So, you know, we do consider our logic model um, a bit of a living document in that way. Um, I also will say um, that uh, the other question was about the ethics of working with young people. So um, Celia Fisher and I had an R01 from NIMHD focused on ethical and regulatory questions of involving um, teenage uh, MSM in HIV research. Um, but a lot of it was focused on, on not just how do we involve them in research, but also how does that generalize to um, the clinical uh, encounter as well. And so we have developed some tools for sort of measuring adolescent consent capacity, um, which is an important consideration when thinking about involving an adolescent in research or clinical care without their parents' involvement. And I'm happy to, if you want to tweet to me or email me, I'm happy to refer you to some of those um, articles that we've published. Um, I think it's a really important issue, and I think you know, some states um, have passed laws, Illinois being one of them, that does allow teens to self-consent to receive PrEP without parental permission, without the involvement of parents, just like teens can get an HIV test in most places without parent involvement, can get treatment uh, for sexually transmitted infections. And so um, some places are updating their laws, but there's still a lot of barriers. You know, I've been at meetings um, where people, you know, organizations that say, well, we have a PrEP assistance program, and then I might raise my hand and say, well, can teens access it? And they say, sure, yeah, we don't have any reason a teen can access it. And then I look at the website. Well, you have to have a utility bill showing that you're a resident of the state. You know, you have to have documentation of X, Y, Z things that most teens aren't gonna have access to. So I think, you know, the law and creating um, a legal framework for teens to be able to self-consent to PrEP is, is great and a, and a huge advantage, but we also have to think about the implementation strategies that would allow teens to navigate a system to get access to um, to get access to prep. And I will point out um, one of our faculty, Catherine McCapagal, has um, a CFAR supplement focused specifically on communicating with teens about prep and adapting prep campaigns for teens. Uh, and uh, hope that those she'll have some results to share about that um, in the next year or so. Okay, thanks, Brian, so much. Um, we really are glad that you were able to give this talk today and be part of our advisory board and support the Miami CIFAR and support our implementation studies, both here and uh, widely for the CIFAR and ARC supplements and such. Um, so thank you tons. And I will turn it over to Savita so that we can uh, get a little bit of wrap up for the, for the morning and um, then go over to Dr. Fauci. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Brian, again. Yes, I want to second everything that uh, Steve said. And this really concludes the first day of our symposium. I want to thank all the presenters for their fantastic talks and the audience for contributing their questions. And I want to remind everyone that tomorrow, our session starts at 9.30 with Dr. Moffinson. Uh, who's going to give a talk on, uh, on the evolution of pediatric HIV. And also to remind people about the discussion forum that we are going to have at 11.45 that is going to be moderated by Dr. Stevenson to discuss general steps on how to address the epidemic both locally and, uh, and nationally. So we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let us know. So signing off for day one. See you tomorrow. <laughs>